Hi, I'm Karen Whitney, Director of Communications with Ohio's Electric Cooperatives, and welcome to this edition of Upfront and Real with our CEO, Pat O'Loughlin. Hi, Pat. Thanks, Karen. Glad to be here with you today. Well, just as winter arrived this year, we received a report from the North American Electric Reliability Council, or NERC, the body that's entrusted with assuring the reliability of our, of our electric power system broadly across North America. Not surprisingly, they've shown that there are some weaknesses across our system, as we kind of all knew, but as this pointed out pretty clearly, there's parts of the country where even under normal circumstances, they need to be concerned about having adequate resources to meet their needs in other parts of the country where it'll be okay as long as everything's normal, but if we have extreme or prolonged weather, as we sometimes do, uh, then they, they will be at risk of having a shortage of electricity as well. And it's really a difficult situation we find ourselves in. PJM, on the other hand, is, is supposed to be one of the better areas in the country, uh, not showing any resource deficiencies at this time. However, we have seen a steady decline in their resource base as well, and it's something we need to worry about going forward. So today we're just gonna go through a, a little bit of review of kind of what happened this recent winter storm and, and where that takes us going forward. All right, so Pat, we saw that PJM map, they showed a snapshot of that day right before Christmas, as we all remember, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, we got the warning that there possibly might be rolling blackouts. Good morning, my name is Mike Bryson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations at PJM. I'm here this morning to just talk to you about the unprecedented cold weather in the region. One of the things we're asking consumers to do is do what they can to conserve electricity. Conservation actually really works. Uh, we have a situation where the cold weather is really causing the demand for electricity to increase. And we also have a situation where some of the power plants on our system are not performing because of the cold weather. One of the things we also want to point out is the possibility of rotating customer outages is real. We are going to do everything we can to try to prevent that, but we think it's important that consumers are ready in case we have to take that step. Thank you. Looking at that temperature map, you know, it was very cold, sub-zero temperatures here in Ohio, but really the whole United States, if you look at that map. Yeah, we got a big cold front that swept in with high winds and really cold temperatures, December 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Um, we, we changed almost 50 degrees here in Ohio from December 22nd to December 23rd. Uh, and then we got brutally cold wind chills, 30 to 40 below, depending in different parts of Ohio. And you're right, it was spread across a broad part of the country from Texas to Florida, all the way up to, the, to New England. So we got hit pretty hard across a pretty broad area. How did that impact our coal supply during that time? Yeah, so one of the great things about having a coal-fired power plant is we've got a, a certain amount of coal on, on site, no matter whether the river is working, the barges are working. We like to have, going into winter, 30 days or so of coal on the ground, so we're ready to go uh, and we're ready to work our way through whatever weather events that might happen. So we were in good shape. And how did the other parts of the country do? We know that MISO uh, is in worse shape than PJM. How did they do in Texas, those other places that were cold as well? Well, so as, as the winter weather increased and the Christmas holiday was coming, a lot of the grid operators like PJM and MISO were surprised at how much load we ended up getting. In fact, there's a chart we'll, we'll look at that shows PJM underestimated their load for Christmas Eve by more than 10%. That's a pretty big miss. Usually two or 3% is considered kind of a bad forecast from day to day, but more than 10% is a huge miss. And, and of course they were, they thought it was going to be lower than it really was due to the holiday, due to the fact that we haven't had weather that cold for several years. So the other thing I'd like to talk about is, is how did we actually do? Because the weather was strong, the load forecasts were off, and what happens when, we're, when we get really cold weather, uh, big machines like power plants don't work as well as they're supposed to, and also natural gas systems are prone to both freeze-ups as well as high demand for, com for commercial and residential use of natural gas, basically heating homes and businesses. So we saw, um, as we have in the past, when it got really cold, natural gas was in short supply to power plants, forcing several of them out. Our power plants, however, were able to get natural gas through the efforts of our of our market operations team and our folks at ACES working together, we were able to secure adequate natural gas to run our power plants. We expected to use some oil, we didn't really have to. Much of the Midwest and Southern US 
had, couldn't get natural gas actually had to use oil, some of it from freezing natural gas, some of it from just a lack of availability. So it was a, it was a really tough day. Um, and then uh, we expected it to be severe, but we over Christmas Eve morning, about three or four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve, it went from severe to all the way to the edge of having to issue, issue rolling blackouts. And, I know you got a text from me uh, kind of early in the morning saying we, we actually needed to begin letting consumers know it was time to do voluntary reductions so that we could avoid mandatory reductions or, or rolling blackouts, which was a possibility on Christmas Eve. So you did send that text out. How did the membership, how did the public respond to that? So we asked them first thing on Christmas Eve morning, which is a Saturday morning. Not everybody was up and ready to you know turn their thermostat down and do other things that we needed to do. but. But we did, through the, through the morning, see a reduction in demand from people voluntarily making changes, and that helped, um, helped us balance our system, even though we were kind of right on the edge. Now, for the Ohio's electric cooperatives at Buckeye Power, we saw an all-time peak on December 23rd. We actually uh, reached a peak a little over 1,900 megawatts. Our previous peak was about 1,800 megawatts, so that's a pretty big jump. And that was going into a holiday weekend. If this had happened a week earlier when we didn't have so many businesses off for the holidays, I think we would have had significantly higher load, not only here for Buckeye, but across the whole country. Yeah, so we could have actually seen some. We could have been in big trouble. Yeah, we were a little lucky. It was, it was sort of the Christmas gift was that it came on a holiday weekend when loads were down a little bit from what they would have been normally. Yeah, and talk about prices. You mentioned in your upfront article in the February Ohio Cooperative Living magazine that prices went way up. They did. So uh, PJM implemented all of its emergency steps, which basically ratchets up the price of electricity to send the signal to generators, hey, you better get going, and also to consumers, hey, you might want to back off. We saw prices as high as $4 a kilowatt hour uh, on parts of December 23rd and 24th, about as high as we've ever seen. Now, to put that in perspective, Buckeye normally sells its wholesale power for about eight cents, and it was uh, being it was worth four dollars a kilowatt hour for many hours on the 23rd and 24th, and at least somewhere between a dollar and four dollars through much of that weekend. Really high prices. Yeah, very high prices. So, are we going to see this every time we get into a peak winter season, peak summer season? Uh, when we have this high demand and we see these extremes? Well, unfortunately, right now, the path we are on, we are gonna to continue to see these kind of uh, difficulties and challenges in just balancing our systems when we have extreme weather. And really what we've seen now a couple of times is winter is even tougher. Even though our loads sometimes for regionally, broadly, are a little bit higher in the summer, in the winter, the natural gas system is really stressed by the cold temperatures as well as the generating plants have a harder time operating. And we see more plants offline, more outages, especially natural gas plants um, that make it even more challenging. But yes, you know, once again this year, we saw uh, continued retirements of fossil fuel generation, particularly coal generation, and all the additions, even though they're about the same amount of megawatts, were largely wind and solar, about 80% wind and solar once again this year, which you know during peak periods provides very little support to our grid. How do we fix this, Pat? How do we make this pressure cooker relieve some pressure? Yeah, well, we can only do so much, but one of the things that we keep advocating for at the federal and state level is, is we've got to get some better policies. Number one, we've got to stop pushing these onerous environmental policies that have very little environmental impact but have a significant cost on, to consumers. We've got to just stop doing dumb things environmentally that don't really provide any benefits but add high costs and ultimately force people to retire their older generators that we still need to have around for several more years. Uh, the other thing is we're, we're gonna have to deal with the compensation that electric generators get paid to be available to back up renewables. If we're gonna have more renewables, we're gonna have to continue to have these fossil fire generators that can be turned on, turned off, ramp up, ramp down to balance our demand and to, to supplement our renewable generators. And right now we just don't recognize in the way we pay for generation the attributes of reliability that some generators bring and other ones do not. We try to treat them all the same. Well, the truth is they're not the same. And so we're gonna to have to change that policy. So we've got a lot of cooperative members in this state, 
speak to them, what can they individually do to help get towards a solution on this? Yeah, well, I, I think we've been doing the right things all along. We've, we've emphasized energy efficiency for people's homes. It, it does matter. Energy is valuable. We should treat it that way and we should use it efficiently. And we've had programs for years and years where we emphasize that. We try to provide rebates and help consumers make their homes and businesses as efficient as possible. That's thing one. Secondly, what we've done for a long time is provide ways to do demand response. So when we do get emergency conditions, our consumer members can help lower their demands a little bit by giving up maybe their hot water for a couple hours, turning down their air conditioning, turning down their heat. So, so those are things that we've done. And frankly, the cooperatives are great at getting the word out and people pitch in together for the common good to try to make things work out. And so, so we've really done a good job on the demand side. On the generation side, again, we're really pulling more than our, our fair share. We, through that whole weekend, produced more electricity than, than our members used, even though we had record demand. Uh, we produced a little bit more, and we got some financial benefits from that, which we'll be able to use to help keep our rates down. Even though we saw higher fuel costs, we're going to get some financial benefits, and we're, we're trying to balance those things out month to month and year to year right now. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. It was really nice having this conversation. And, you know, unfortunately, it is uh, something we're going to have to be used to for a couple more years, and we're going to have to adapt and adjust while we continue to advocate for changes that we know we need and that are good for consumers, and that's what we're going to continue to try to do.